So good morning to everyone who's here. Um, let me also start off by saying uh, my background actually comes out of the disability rights movement. So I worked in the disability rights movement with nonprofit organizations for about 20 years before I started to work for the government. And therefore, it was particularly important for me to be able to be with all of you today um, as you prepare for the next week of working at the International AIDS Conference. I'd like to thank um, all the organizers of this meeting because I think we know very clearly, as all of you have been saying this morning, that the inclusion of disabled people into, in this case, the HIV AIDS movement has been very slow. And you are here today and this week because of the leaders that you are from the countries that you represent and because collectively your voices really will be able to be heard and you will be able to continue to advance the inclusion of disability into the HIV AIDS discussion. So I think you all have a great responsibility here. Um, many of you are youth leaders, but that doesn't mean that you are not in full leadership positions. So I think you should hold um, the fact that you're here and the work that you'll be doing over the next week quite seriously, which I'm sure you do. A number of you have mentioned the issue of empowerment. I think all of you are empowered people who don't just represent yourselves, but also represent those people in your community, in your country, in the continents that you come from. It is a little ironic to me that disability isn't specifically mentioned in the UN AIDS conference report. Because in the United States, under a law called the Americans with Disabilities Act, people with AIDS are considered to have a disability. So in reality, 100% of people who have AIDS have disabilities. But in many cases, they do not recognize themselves as having disabilities. And I want to speak about this for a moment. In the 1970s and 80s, I worked with an organization called the Center for Independent Living. In the United States, we now have about 500 centers for independent living. They are community-based organizations that are led by disabled people. The law requires that at least 50% of the staff of these organizations have disabilities and that at least 50% of the board of directors have disabilities. The Centers for Independent Living are policy organizations and advocacy organizations. And by law, in order to receive money from the national government or from some of the state governments, they must be cross-disability. That means people have physical disabilities, sensory disabilities, developmental or intellectual disabilities, mental health disabilities, epilepsy, diabetes, a whole range. This group, first one in Berkeley, started in 1973. And we began to do a lot of very aggressive organizing. One of the issues that we worked on starting in about 1977, 78, was the problem of violence against disabled women. Women were getting, coming to the center 
to get assistance in finding housing, learning about benefits that they were eligible for, learning about their rights. But we were also beginning to hear from women who were in living in arrangements where they were experiencing rape or other forms of violence. So we wanted to refer these women to shelters that were in the San Francisco, Berkeley area. And we found that the shelters were not willing to take women with disabilities, whether they were blind or deaf or had a physical disability where they could walk or they were in wheelchairs. The shelters felt that they were not <coughs> qualified to provide services. So we were very upset about that and we were able to get some funding to train the women at these shelters about how they had to begin to serve women with disabilities. So we had women with disabilities actually do the training for the women in the shelters, not just to discuss the physical barriers, but to also enable the people working in these shelters to understand that disabled women do experience the same types of violence as non-disabled women. And I think we also have learned over the years when data is actually being collected that violence against disabled people is more frequent than against non-disabled people. So this money that we were able to get proved very important because it resulted in many of the shelters becoming accessible. Now one of the important parts of that is also that people learn from each other. Disabled women going to these shelters allow others to understand that the problems are the same, the solutions are similar. You may need an interpreter, you may need physical accessibility, you may, may need materials that are available for people who are blind and work a little differently with people who have intellectual disabilities. But at the end of the day, everyone is different and we have to learn how to work to meet the needs of individual people. So the story that I'm saying here is the ability of an advocacy group like the Berkeley Center for Independent Living to demand change and to demand change in this particular case of the women's shelters. In 1981, when AIDS was becoming much more visible around the world slowly, there was a small amount of money that the county that we lived in, in Berkeley, was putting forward to do work with people who had AIDS. And CIL applied for funding because we were a cross-disability organization. Some of the people working there were from the LGBT community. And this was an issue that we were becoming aware of. And at that point, we also saw people who had AIDS as being a part of the disability community, even if they did not see themselves as being a part of our community. So it was a very interesting experience because at that point, people were still very much looking at this as a medical issue, trying to find medications to prevent and cure. We were saying that's all very important, but right now we think 
it's important for you to try to move forward with your life. And so we believe it's important to learn about certain things. If you have a job, don't leave your job unless you're really not able to work. Because once you leave your job, you lose your economic ability to be as independent as you were before. Um, we talked about peer support, which, excuse me, which is people with disabilities talking to each other like you're doing here and like you do at home, sharing experiences, personal experiences, and experiences of the group. Storytelling is very important, and that's one thing I'll talk about in a minute. This project in 1981 was somewhat successful, but not as successful as it became later on, because we were kind of too advanced. Uh, people were not ready to look at themselves as having a disability and being a part of the disability community. I think that is slightly changing now. Um, in many more cases, um, here and around the world, disabled people with, who may not have AIDS are working with other disabled people who do to share information, to help them learn about their rights, to say, you have a right to continue to live your life. You have a right not to experience discrimination. And you need to look at the laws that either exist in your country or laws that you are working on as a result of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is, as Janet was saying earlier, very, very important. In my view, the changes that we are making around the world, in part, are when countries have strong laws that deal with issues like what I call the built environment, making sure that the built environment, streets, buildings, schools, healthcare clinics, hospitals, are accessible physically and that the staff are trained to be able to work with people who have various types of disabilities. Until we have laws that are being enforced that really break down these barriers, it makes it very difficult for many people with different types of disabilities to really become active in our communities. So I really encourage you, with everything on your plate, that you continue to look at broad ways of addressing the problems that exist in your countries. HIV AIDS is only one of them. That's what this conference is about this week. But then you're gonna go home at the end of the week. And when you really, even just focusing on this issue, listen to all of the things that you've said, the devaluation of people based on their disability, people not feeling empowered, healthcare workers not feeling that we can be sexually active, people not acknowledging the violence that we experience as disabled individuals, and the double and triple exposure that we have to contracting AIDS and other disabilities. Um, these are things that you will go back home and continue to work on. I want to say that you should see yourselves this week not only as leaders, but as teachers and as learners. And I think it's very important that you see yourself playing these multiple roles. I talk about you as uh, learners because there will be a lot of important information coming out of the conference this week. And you need to learn some of that information because that information also helps you have discussions 
with health care providers and other people in the community here at this conference and at home. You need to learn some of the terminology. You need to teach your own terminology. You need to be able to talk about some of the basic things that you've been discussing this morning, like working with pharmacists, working in schools, and giving real practical experiences. Because that's one of the very big issues. People practically do not know what to do. So you are the knowledgeable people with practical information. You are also, like others, still identifying questions that have no answers. But there are answers to be had. So you need to be making, like try to find people from your countries when you're here who are not just a part of this group. Find out who they are. I'm sure you know some of them already. And talk with them more. Everybody's excited about being here. And you, like them, need to show the pride and power that you have in being here and the teaching that you can give now and when you're home, and the learning that you can do now and when you're home. I want to talk for a minute about parents. I think, um, you know, the role of parents is kind of a confusing one. Because I think on the one hand, not just on this subject, but in disability in general, many people feel that parents are a big part of the problem because they haven't done A or B or C. One of the things that we did at the Berkeley Center for Independent Living was to bring parents into our organization because we felt that it was, and still feel, that it is very important for adults and youth with disabilities to be able to work with parents who in many cases don't know just like others. They don't know. I think it was Barbara who said her grandmother asked the question, was it you, Barbara? Who yeah. Um, did she have menstruation? That just shows the level of lack of knowledge. It's not an issue of contempt. It's genuine lack of knowledge. And I think in looking at it that way, in looking at you know, how we can help parents learn. That's very, very important. And, excuse me. In some cases, some of your parents have learned. And some of your parents can be very good advocates in helping, can I get some water? In helping other parents learn. When we talk about going into the schools and working with children, the parents obviously also have to play a very important role. And I think we have seen over and over again that parents are ready to learn, especially, thanks. So I, let's, let's look at parents by and large as allies. Let's look at adults, which all of us are in this room, and really have discussions with the parents about the important role they need to play. Because parents are the ones who are going to be the advocates or not be the advocates for their children in school, in getting their children in school, in helping to make sure that their children are learning and are getting appropriate information. So I, I went through many of these uh, experiences in the 70s when we brought parents in to work at the center because there was a lot of heated debate about whether or not we, th we wanted parents to be a part of our work. And once it happened, we saw the real value. And then, of course, some of you are parents with disabilities who have disabled children. So you, too, are additional leaders in what you can be doing to help other parents learn. I'd like to know from you here, how many of you are now at home 
working in women's coalitions that are broader than disability women's groups? How many of you are working with women's groups more broadly? One. Okay. How many of you have tried to work with some of the women's coalitions in your country and not been successful? In Ethiopia, were you not successful? Find and there I could work with different organizations for women like Ethiopian, uh, uh, Ethiopian Women uh, Lawyers Association and uh, New Network of Women's Associations. But now I am working for the Federation of Ethiopian National Associations of Persons with Disabilities. And uh, I mean, it's not obvious as I was working in Ethiopian National Association of the Blind. Thank you. I think it's important to work in coalition work with women's groups. How many of you are working with human rights organizations in your country? The human rights organizations. Okay, more people, but not, okay. I think in another year, every, thank you, everybody should be able to raise your hand because it's very important that we work in coalition with other people. There are many reasons for this. One of them is it gives our issues greater legitimacy. Another reason is it helps all of us learn. It helps the coalition of organizations or people who don't have disabilities to learn about our issues, to learn about areas of commonality, and it helps us learn more. I've worked in many, many, many different cross-disability and working with non-disability, human rights, civil rights, women's organizations. In the end, it's very important because the more people that understand our issues and the more we understand other people's issues, the more we can strengthen the broader movement. And in the end, we're fighting against discrimination, not just based on disability, not just based on gender, but on race, religion, ethnicity, sexual preference. We're really in, that's our objective, is to work to improve all of the communities around the world <laughs> to rid themselves of discrimination. And we're one of the last groups that wear multiple hats. So we'll open this up for a few minutes, but I, I just wanted to say that um, your leaders, your learners, your teachers, you should think for yourselves, in addition to the questions that you're gonna be developing to ask in the different sessions, what questions you may wanna ask in other meetings that you're gonna be going to. If you're shy, like I have been in many cases at these big meetings, make sure that you don't go by yourself. You know, break up into groups of two or three. Don't avoid going to a meeting or don't avoid going to a reception because you feel, you know, a little bit awkward. I, I kind of joke, when I go into receptions, the first thing I see is everybody's What's the right word? Butts. <laughs> because everybody's standing and I'm down low. And in a big room, it's like very hard for me to hear people. But you know, you just figure it out. If you're deaf or you're blind, you have other issues, but you'll have interpreters with you and you'll have another guide person with you. So be bold and brave and just, this is a very unique opportunity. You're unique or you wouldn't be here, so take advantage of this unique opportunity to be able to set goals and objectives for what you then want to be able to do when you go home. I think that's very important. Try to meet people here who you can work with at home. And in addition to speaking out at the 
four or five meetings that Paula discussed this morning. Have questions that you can ask in any of the workshops you're going to. Really raise the issue about how can there be yet another report coming out from UNAIDS that doesn't include disability. It is completely unacceptable. And I think in the resolution that you're going to do today, that has to play a prominent role. And I think one of the other issues is, you know, we're looking at this as part of the rights movement. And these meetings are also heavily influenced by the medical profession. And one can understand that. But your goal, you are human rights leaders. And that's what they have to understand. Someone said earlier, Human rights are disability rights, and that is the theme. Human rights are disability rights. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is a critical tool, and you are part of the international movement that is really working to end discrimination against disabled people and all other minority groups. So thank you, and then let's open this up. So some questions or comments? Barbara. Do you have a question? Okay, so I used to teach second grade. So that means I call on people if people don't raise their hand. So there must be a comment you want to make, something you want to say, something, a story you want to tell. Yep. Agnes, I think, right? Thank you so much for it's on. a very informative presentation. I just want to know from your own experience, as, as young people, we, we tend to get um, so passionate and somehow we get so many ideas and so many things coming our way and we're so excited, but at the end of the day, we lose focus and we, we, we're not as passionate as we grow older of the things that we grasped when we were young or so. How, do you, how did you manage to, to stay passionate up until now, even after working with NGOs for, for such a long time? You're still an activist up, up until now, because I really want to be that when I'm that age. So I guess <laughs> that age. So I, I'm 64, if you can believe it. Um, so I, I guess the reason why I'm so passionate is because I still experience so many problems myself. So if I lived in a world now where I didn't experience problems like almost every day, then maybe I wouldn't feel so passionate. But I know that the problems that I experience are experienced by many other people. And I've never been a person who liked to work on things by myself. And you know, I very much, um, I talk about my experiences uh, both, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, which is why I am who I am. And then, <laughs> and then I lived in Berkeley, California for about 18 years. And now I've been in DC about 20 years. Um, I get excited and inspired, I think, like everybody in this room, by being able to work with other people who have a similar vision. And in the beginning, when we had very little in the United States, very few laws. I define things as like being in a candy store. Because, you know, you go into a candy store as a kid, and there's so many different kinds of candy. You have a nickel or whatever it is, and you can only get one thing, but how you decide. And in the disability movement, we have discrimination in education, in higher education, in healthcare, in employment in transportation, in public accommodations. So, so many areas to work on. How do you prioritize? Uh, in part, what I think we see all around the world is people's personal passions begin to drive where you go. And I think it's important with all of the wonderful organizations 
that are being set up in different countries, that the groups come together and set priorities, which I know many of you are doing. And then in those priorities, you decide where you fit best. But coming together and, and being able to share success stories as well as ongoing problems, I think continues to motivate people. And also, one problem affects the other. It's what I was saying earlier. So when we come and talk about all the issues that have been raised around health, you know, it's not just uh, training general society about the fact that disabled people are sexually active by choice or not. It's not just the issue of training of healthcare workers. It's not just the issue of lack of accessibility in buildings. It's not just the issue of not being able to get out of one's home if you live in a village or in an urban area because you don't have access to transportation or a wheelchair, whatever it may be. It's all of those things. And so m for me, it's being able to look at the problem in toto. You can't change it all at once, but you can take it apart. Find the people who are the most knowledgeable who can work on different issues. And, and I find, you know, our work is very exciting because we are making changes. I mean, the CRPD is a fantastic example of what the international disability community has been able to do. And then at the national level is where the real challenges are. And I think working together on that is very important. And I think we need to look, every day is an urgent day, and that everything will not be done in a day. So we have to be committed. It's a lifelong commitment. That's my personal feeling. In the back, Barbara. Thank you, Judy, for that wonderful presentation. We really feel encouraged and ready to face the challenge. Um, I would like to ask you, um, in your work with women, that is, you talked about women in general, if I am right, have you done any sp special or got engaged in s any special programs for young women with disabilities? And uh, I mean, any special programs, have you done any work on that? And then, um, have you done or engaged into any research targeting young women with disabilities? Because it seems it is a huge challenge back home. Um, there is very limited research done around the area of uh, uh, young women with disabilities and HIV AIDS, for example. And uh, there is really limited data on this. Have you done anything like that? Would I would like to learn from you. So personally, I haven't done research in that area, but I've supported. Um, we have, over the last 20 years, been uh, well, really longer, uh, working on helping to strengthen and help develop youth movements, including uh, young women in the youth movements. So there have been many different approaches <coughs> that we've used. When I was at the center in Berkeley, uh, we uh, ran a project that worked with young women and young boys, youth in their college, um, high school years, where we brought them together once a month to meet with each other to talk about issues um, that they were addressing in their teenage years. We also brought parents together four times a year to help the parents get a better understanding and become more empowered in work that we were doing. There have been a number of projects in the U.S. and internationally that have been doing some research work on issues around youth with disabilities. Um, and I can try to help you get some of that information. But I think, you know, we've focused, uh, interestingly enough, I've seen in Africa much more focus specifically on disabled women than, for example, in, in the U.S. Disabled women's groups, there haven't been that many of them. 
we've been more cross disability, including women and young women and men together than just separate organizations. So um, we've been very conscious of trying to ensure that organizations are sexually balanced, you know, equal women and e equal young women and, and uh, youth males um, to be able to address some of those issues. Um, but uh, honestly speaking, I think on some of those issues, Africa has been more of a leader on, on uh, specifically doing work with women's, disabled women's groups. But I think um, there were a number of books that were written and are still being written, and maybe um, you can get some help here to look for them, uh, that have been written on disabled women's issues. A woman named Marcia Saxton, S-A-X-T-O-N, has done a lot of writing in this area. Um, a woman named Simi Litbeck, or, no, sorry, Simi Linton, L-I-N-T-O-N, has done work in this area. Um, a woman named Adrian Ash, A-S-C-H-E, has done research in this area. And I'm sure you could get, look at these books online under Amazon. Uh, I would like to thank you for the wonderful facilitation and uh, it's very encouraging, and I'll take the information even back home of what I've learned uh, back home, yeah. I have a question. Uh, do you work uh, for the uh, government depart department? Uh, because I would like uh, us as a disabled in Africa to be helped. For instance, we have the USAID. Uh, they are in Zambia, it uh, does mainly support only targeting the able-bodied. And uh, when us as the disabled request for support, well, the response that we receive is very negative and our projects are, are not considered. So how can we partner with that? Because we, I can see this is a negative attitude and you feel ob being oppressed and disabled. Thank you. So I right now work for the Department of State and USAID, um, is, is, it's always difficult, how do you explain USAID under state? <laughs> anyway, we work together. So um, let me say that I think you're gonna be meeting a woman named Charlotte McLean Nklapo at one of the receptions on Wednesday night. Um, Charlotte works for USAID. Um, both in the State Department and in USAID, we are very much working on getting disability more integrated into the work of our respective organizations. I encourage people who ha are having difficulty, in this case with an AID office, to write a letter and complain because there may be legitimate reasons why you weren't successful in applying for money, but there also may be problems that the staff within the organization just don't understand the issues and don't take what you're looking for seriously. In the State Department, what we've been doing is, uh, and with USAID together, uh, working both to help train the staff within our organizations about why disability rights are human rights and to get a better understanding of the kinds of discrimination that people are facing. Because I think, as I said in the beginning, in many cases, because of lack of exposure, people think about, or really don't think about, disabled people in the same way. So we have been working with embassies to invite disabled people to the embassies to talk in a round table about what some of the issues are that people are facing. 
Uh, when I was in Kenya last year, we had a meeting uh, specifically inviting disabled youth who came to meet in the embassy with staff to talk about some of the specific uh, problems that disabled people are facing in healthcare, in education, in getting a driver's license, basic everyday problems. Uh, we've done that now in quite a number of countries. Also, it's important for you all to know that the Department of State issues a report every year. It's called the Human Rights Report. The Human Rights Reports are supposed to include information on what is happening to disabled people in their country, types of violations. They're all online, you can read them, and they're in English and the language of the country. Uh, you will see that some of the reports are good and some of the reports are not so good. So one thing we encourage you all to do is to contact the human rights officer or the political affairs officer in the embassy to say that you would like to meet with them to discuss the uh, report so you can share information. Some of you are coming to the State Department on Wednesday. How many of you are how many of you in this room are coming to the State Department on Wednesday? One, two. You know there are more. So um, we're, we're having some people coming over to the State Department on Wednesday to meet with staff in the State Department who work um, in, the, in particular countries so that you can speak with them about some of the issues that you're trying to address. And I'll, I'll talk to Paula at the end of this to see if we can try to get more people to participate in that meeting. But um, we know we have a lot more to do and you need to keep raising it and you need to be critical when things aren't going right and when things are going right, you can say thank you also. Other comments? Okay. I'm just curious to hear from you that, uh, do you think that disability can make someone strong? I'm um, asking this, what? can make someone a strong, strong. I'm asking this because some say that disability is an opportunity and the others say the opposite. And we uh, here as a youth with disabilities and Leaders need to know the way how can make our disability uh, uh, just to be taken as an advantage or as an opportunity. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, how many of you see that you've been able to take your disability and turn it into an advantage? Raise your hands. Okay, so by the end of the week, you should all be able to raise your hands. And by that I mean, you know, if you're a woman, if you're gay, if you're a lesbian, if you have a disability, if you have all of those, you know, we need to see ourselves as being empowered people. So whatever it is that we happen to have, we need to use it to our advantage. And certainly I think for many disabled people, particularly those of us who have been able to fight against all the discrimination that we experience, we're fighters. Everybody in this room is a fighter or you would not be here. Some of you may be a more verbal fighter than other people, but the bottom line is nobody would be here if you weren't a fighter. So I think we need to also work very closely with newly disabled individuals um, to help them kind of get over um, the fact that they may be experiencing discrimination for the first time in their lives. And if you grow up in communities like we all have, 
where people feel that someone with a disability is a less valuable person, then we have to help people realize that they are not a less valuable person. Because once that person can feel equally strong or stronger, then they become a leader of, for themselves and a leader in the community. And that's really, I think, what this is all about. Boyer. Okay. Uh, Edgar has written something here. He said he understood you well. He's reading from the, the screen. Uh, he's asking, he, he's a volunteer at Straight Talk Foundation, and uh, Straight Talk works with young people in sexual reproductive health through communication and uh, social behavior change, and uh, we work through media and face-to-face uh, -face approaches. Now he's asking how can Straight Talk partner with you, your organization, to strengthen their work among young people with disabilities, especially in reproductive health? So I work for a government agency, and uh, we can talk. There is a, an office on youth, and so it would be helpful if I get information about Straight Talk so we can also share it with the Office on Youth in the State Department, and then there's an Office on Youth at USAID. So that would be one thing that we can do. The other is I've, I've given you this piece of paper. Uh, we, how many of you are on Facebook? Okay, so I expect by the end of tomorrow that every one of you has friended us on Facebook. Because this will allow you, if you have websites, to link to put your information on our Facebook so people can link back to you. So this is a way of sharing the good work that you're doing. Um, we can share information on Straight Talk um, with the embassies where you have, how many countries are you in, in Straight Talk? We are only in Uganda. Okay. We are only in Uganda. That's okay, but we can make sure that the embassy in Uganda <laughs> knows. So for example, we just, uh, the State Department just helped facilitate a discussion that was held in Ethiopia with 12 leaders from Africa disabled leaders. Uh, we're sending out Monday a letter to all of the ambassadors to let them know about the meeting that we held and to also, excuse me, also give them the names of all of the people who participated in the meeting. And we're asking them, if you don't know these people, please have someone on your staff contact them. So we can do the same thing for all of you who are in this room, we can get the list of the people that are here from Paul and Stephen. We can send a similar letter out to let people know that you were here, you actively participated, and we'd like them to know you. We can do that. And then um, at the State Department, there's um, a visitors program. It's called the International Visitors Leadership Program. <coughs> and um, the embassies identify issues and people to send to the United States for a few weeks on particular topics. So it's another thing to learn what the embassy is doing, read their websites, um, because they have many different types of programs. The Visitors Leadership Program, the Fulbright Fellowships, actually have had a fair number of disabled people that are regularly participating. So, okay, one more comment. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I would just like to know, is it on? Yes. What is the process to have an input in the State Department Human Rights Report? Because from prior experience, government tend to be embarrassed or react if there's a negative, um, well, a negative statement or, or, or something of that nature as it regards human rights violation in, in reports that are published by the State Department? Well, that's, 
I'm sure that's true. But look at the, so my suggestion is, any of you have an interest in human rights report, go and look at the report for your country. <coughs> and um, I think you'll see that th there are critical statements being made. That's the purpose of the report. And if disability is not being appropriately represented, if you don't feel that the language really reflects the kinds of barriers that you're facing, you need to address it. On the piece of paper that I've given you, um, there are two, in addition to the e um, Facebook page, my email and a colleague of mine, Kathy Guernsey, are listed. So also if you've tried to contact a human rights officer and you're having difficulty doing that, please write to us so that we can help with that. I wanted to ask you what's happening uh, about ratification of uh, UNCRPD uh, by United States because I know that in recent time there was some hearing in a uh, Foreign Affairs Committee on July 12, uh, if I'm not wrong. You're right. So we had our here. So <coughs> countries ratify the CRPD different ways. In the United States, the president signs and then our Senate has to recommend by two-thirds of the Senate that the president ratify. So we had a hearing on July 12th. It's online, so you actually can go and look at it. Um, I was one of the people who testified. There were about seven or eight other people who testified. The hearing was about three, three and a half hours. It's a good, I, I think if you have time to look at it, it's worthwhile looking at because you get an understanding of uh, how our uh, government works here. Um, at the end of the hearing, I'm s yeah, at the end of the hearing, the next step here is that the committee, so it was the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that held the hearing. Then the committee has to convene and review the proposal, and they have the right to make amendments, and then they vote either to send it forward to the full Senate or to kill it. So the, m what we call markup, the markup will occur next Thursday. And it's open, so if you don't have meetings that you have to go to, uh, you can come to the markup. And so we can let Paula know where it is. I think it's an open markup. So it would be very interesting to see what happens. Um, at that meeting, um, it will be decided as to whether or not the bill itself gets approved to move forward to the Senate floor. So we're hoping that there will be a successful vote and that it will move to the Senate floor. And we're hoping that that could happen the next week. There's been a lot of work in the U.S. on this. Um, an organization called the United States International Council on Disability, which is one of the sponsors of this event, has played an incredibly important role in working with the cross-disability uh, movement in the United States to get them very activated. There's some opposition from a few organizations um, to the bill. And so right now, that's what we're in the middle of. But you can go online. If you go to uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, you should be able to get it. You may also be able to get it on our Facebook because it's supposed to be going up. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I. Uh, know that you will have an incredibly successful week and you each need to have your own goals and objectives about what you want to accomplish as well as what the whole group will be accomplishing. And I look forward to hearing from Stephen, Stephen, Paula about what happens. Thank you.